Welcome to this year's first View from the Top. We're extremely excited to kick off this year's series with Raz Brewer, the Chief Operating Officer and Group President for Starbucks. Raz was born and raised in Detroit. She earned her bachelor's degree in chemistry from Spelman College and began her first job as a scientist at the Kimberly Clark Corporation. She spent more than two decades at the company, moving into business operations and eventually becoming the president of one of the company's global divisions. In 2006, Raz was hired as a regional vice president at Walmart. Six years later, she became the president and the CEO of Sam's Club. She was the first woman and the first African-American to lead a division at Walmart. She then joined Starbucks as chief operating officer in 2017 and has been much celebrated for her success there, even before helping to lead the company through uh, the COVID pandemic. Fortune has named Raz to its list of 50 most powerful women in business. She's been featured in an exhibition on game changers at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History. And Working Mother Magazine has named her to the list of top 10 most powerful moms, which is pretty awesome, actually. Uh, two years ago, Raz delivered the commencement address at her alma mater, Spelman College. And at that time, Mary Campbell, the president of the college, said, those glass ceilings are real, but Raz Brewer has become an adept glass cutter. She has walked the same road as many of you and with relentless determination. So we're looking forward to hearing more about Raz's story and her achievements in today's conversation with Joy Wong, MBA 21. Raz, thank you so much for joining us. It's really wonderful to have you. Thank you for having me. Raz, we are so excited to finally have you join us. Thank you. There's a lot of ground to cover today. Um, we'll talk a lot about how you lead large organizations and dive deeper into your leadership style. But first, I would love to start from the beginning and talk about some early influences that you had in your life. Sure, let's do it. So Roz, many of us don't really start developing our leadership still, uh, styles until quite late in life. But from what I learned, you seem to have had a really strong voice from very early on. In fact, you were suspended from school in third grade. What happened? <laughs> you know, it amazes me what uh, people can find out about me. Um, but yes, that did happen. Um, you know, early on, um, you know, some might uh, call me as a troublemaker, but, you know, being the youngest of five, I knew how to, you know, really fight for that last uh, piece of bread on the table. So the youngest of five taught me how to be, you know, uh, take care of myself. But, you know, in third grade, um, I got into trouble because, you know, I was sitting in class and, uh, you know, the teacher is teaching math and I had older siblings and, you know, she's teaching this long way to do this problem. And so I just thought I'd just get up and help her out, you know, and just say, no, there's a shortcut to this. And so I keep telling her until, the point where the next thing I knew, long story short, my parents were at school picking me up, uh, you know, because um, I was adamant about taking that chalk and uh, teaching uh, the teacher and the class, you know, a shortcut on a, a math problem or two. So um, it was one way to get in trouble. And, um, you know, my parents, you know, I thought I was really in trouble. But, you know, I, I think after a while, I watched how many times I would laugh at all the stuff I would do as I was growing up. But uh, I think that was my start. That's an amazing story. And that's actually funny because here at the GSB, there's this tradition for uh, doing shenanigans in class. And one of them is that you would get up halfway and you would go to the whiteboard and teach. Um, so it is very funny to me how we're obviously copying what you did in third grade at the age of 26. Exactly, it's, it's, it was crazy. <laughs> Never grow old. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, so you said that your parents kind of find that funny um, how did they react to the incident and, and broadly, how did your parents shape your values? Sure. Well, I think it was eventually they thought it was funny because initially, you know, my parents were so adamant about education. And, you know, I grew up in a family in a household where kids were um, to be seen and not heard, you know. And so we were, you know, always, you know, shuttered off to do the things that we were right. And it was a very strict household. 
um, a lot of that came from my parents did not have the opportunity to go to college. And quite honestly, neither finished high school. And so for them to have five children, and I'm the youngest of five, acting out in school was totally unacceptable because they knew, you know, it's a fine thread between, you know, getting kicked out of school once and what can happen to you. I think what made it a little funny was because I really wasn't acting out. I was just trying to get my voice heard, right? And so I think they began to see that, you know, I want to use my voice and, you know, maybe I had raised my hand and she didn't pay attention to me, you know? And so they started really understanding the, the dynamics in some of the classrooms, you know? And so it, it turned into a different story, but quite honestly, that would have been disciplinary and action by my parents because they were so strict about education. They didn't want us to miss a thing. And so um, it was a beginning of us, you know, really having um, conversations about what does it take to be excellent and what's the expectation of you. And they would constantly raise the bar for everything in our lives. And so for all five of us to go to college on the backs of two parents who you know, never really were able to do that and worked in the automotive, automotive industry was really um, heroic on my parents' part. Yeah, and it sounds like they really instilled this, this confidence in you and, and a drive and to, uh, to, to speak up and, and have a strong voice. Um, and with that confidence, you then decided um, to leave home and then attended uh, Spelman College. And you have often talked about Spelman as a very defining experience for you. So I'm, I'm curious, what were some lessons that you learned there that stay with you until today? Sure. So, you know, Spelman's a very small school, private, um, black, all women's college in the South. I grew up in Detroit. And um, first of all, I had never experienced, you know, the, the Southern life. Um, and it was vastly different for me. I was the only, being the youngest of five, I'm the only one that went, to, went away to school. Everyone else, it's wonderful schools in the state of Michigan. I wanted to move away and I did. But Spelman, when I got there, I realized that it was my new home. Because in that environment, first of all, I love that it was a liberal arts institution because I got a chance to really dive into critical thinking and they were getting all into your head about things that I'd never really thought about. But then also too, it's such a nurturing environment to have a you know, first name basis with your professors and, um, and the, all, the entire faculty, it was very special to me. And to be in the environment of people who, women who look like me, but came from all different walks of life, I thought I was in a, knew that I was in a very unique situation. And so going to an HBCU is a very deliberate decision. You're, you're deciding to go into an environment that's, that's pretty unique, especially all women. But I, I remember a couple of experiences that made me realize how special Spelman was. So um, by my senior year, my dad had been diagnosed with cancer. And um, spring break of my senior year, I'm studying for the GMAT trying to finish my major in chemistry, minor in um, math, all at the same time when I get the call that I need to get home because this looks like, you know, my father was um, moving, was passing on. And so this was six weeks before graduation. And, um, you know, all of a sudden I get my organic teacher changing all of my um, test dates for me so that I can test when I get back. Uh, the school chaplain was in my dorm room like within 10 minutes after getting the call and you know everyone was just rallying around me just trying to give me the strength to get home get my dad buried get back to school take the gmat and graduate in six weeks and um you know i don't know that that would have happened for me at any other institution and so it is something to have that kind of feeling and closeness that i will absolutely never forget my experience at spelman because I felt like people saw me for me and um, not as, you know, another number in the school. So it's, it's a special place, a very special place. That sounded like a really hard experience to go through and I'm so glad that the school was fully supportive for you. Um, you did talk a lot about it being, being a strong community. Um, so during my research, I actually came across something on social media. Um, if you could see on the screen, you probably remember this. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, wow. 
Yeah, that was October 2nd, uh, 2018, the day it was announced that I was uh, the new chief operating officer for Starbucks. Yeah, so this, this was an amazing time um, all over the country, actually all over the world. Um, I had um, my sorority sisters, actually I'm an Alpha Kappa Alpha, uh, uh, just like uh, Kamala uh, Harris. And so, uh, you know, they rallied around me and every drive through or store they went into, they ordered their drink and put my name on it. And it was, it was overwhelming when I saw, I didn't see this because I was involved in the press releases that morning and I got back to my hotel room, I was in Seattle and I turned on social, you know, I was starting to look at my social media feed and I saw all these cups and I just absolutely lost it. I mean, I remember I slipped off the bed onto the floor and I was just like, oh my God, can, did they really do this? And it was just a reminder that there's no other place um, in the world that you can feel like, you know, someone accepts you for you. And it was, you know, my sorority, my college, um, and uh, it was a truly heartfelt moment, but it was amazing. It was really great. Yeah, it's so incredible to see that the relationships that you had were still so strong. It was 20 odd years later. Um, and also just inspiring to, to see that you have such an impact on your community. Well, it was, it was, it was something else. It was amazing. Now, Roz, um, your influence, obviously, at impact extends way beyond Spoment into the many organizations that you've been part of. And as a leader, what you like to say is that you like to lead both with your head and with your heart. Yeah. So I thought we should start with the first piece, leading with the head. Now, you've been in the retail industry for more than 10 years now, and um, you were quite the visionary during a lot of time. Um, for example, when you were at Sam's Club, you invested a lot of efforts into curbside pickup and e-commerce efforts, um, which was quite ahead of many of the, the offline retailer peers. Um, and still a really critical piece of the, the strategy for Walmart today. Um, so I'm curious, now you're leading Starbucks, you're on the board of, of Amazon. What are some big bets that you're making on the future of retail? Sure. So, you know, um, it's interesting because some of that work I'm bringing forward with me uh, to Starbucks, um, but I will say that joining Starbucks, Starbucks had a fantastic digital flywheel once I joined there and their loyalty program was very strong. Um, but as you know, any business leader will tell you is that every day it's about trade-offs. Can we continue to invest in all of the technology that we need to have and still do everything else we need to do to innovate at the company? And so myself, along with many others, because there's some extremely bright, brilliant talent at Starbucks, I am so fortunate to have the kind of partners that I have there. But we created uh, together um, an innovation lab. And in that innovation lab, we began to think about how do we change the engine of making coffee at Starbucks? And so we have baristas that love the beautiful craft of making a wonderful latte. And so they wanna be seen doing that. Um, but actually, you know, we're pretty popular right now. And so in the morning, you know, we have stores that will do, you know, uh, you know, some astronomical number um, of coffee cups per minute, right? And so we uh, began to look at a new engine at uh, Starbucks. And so we introduced a new uh, model where it's a pickup only store where everything is digital. We flip the kitchen to the back. And um, we've opened up several of those. We have three or four of those in our unit, but we just recently announced we're gonna um, add more of these pickup units to our, 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 um, our fleet. Uh, so the technology uh, goes on and on with, with Starbucks. So it starts also with the stores and then also too, relieving our baristas of having to do any kind of manual work, like manual scheduling. So all scheduling is automated, centralized planning and replenishment is underway. Um, everything that we're doing from optimizing the drive through window. And what's so interesting is that going into this COVID experience in life where we're trying to create social distancing, everything that we had in our innovation pipeline, we've been able to bring it forward pretty quickly. So that's been part of our recovery plan. We had innovation plans three to five years out. We're now executing that on an eight, by 18 months, we'll have all of that innovation 
out in the field. And so it's pretty exciting. It's around beverage innovation, the store innovation, and then what we continue to do with the digital flywheel. So, um, you know, I've, um, I'm very grateful for the work um, and the things that I learned at Walmart because I'm actually bringing that forward at Starbucks. And it's exciting to have, you know, be with a coffee company that's so digitally, you know, sound as we are. So it's, it's pretty exciting. And one thing that you mentioned that will probably continue after the pandemic is this trend towards everything going more virtual and digital, right? And you talk about um, changing store formats into pickup only. Um, it seems like a very particular problem to, to, to Starbucks because the company has always prided itself on being the third place and a place where people will come together and, and relax and have a great conversation. Um, yeah. So how do you think about creating and maintaining that connection and that community in, in a virtual world? Yes, and you know, that is one of the things that we put, you know, um, we look at our work as what are the most significant problems we can solve, and that is one of them because, you know, that's what we admire about our mission and values is that third place. But when you approach a Starbucks and you see the, the familiarity of your barista that you love and that you can say, hello, how are you, Jessica, and you remember your barista, your barista remembers the customer, it starts right there. And that's whether you're handing something through the drive through window or you're going out to curbside. And we, right now, I'll tell you, our customer connection scores are higher than they were pre-COVID. And that's pretty exciting um, to see that, you know, first of all, um, we know that people are starving for connection again, and they're starving for something that they're familiar with so that, you know, their customized beverage is something that they look forward to. And when Starbucks opened back up, they were like, oh my gosh, okay, there's something that's normal here and I can see my barista and um, we never underestimate that. So the things that we're doing is we're just trying our best to free up our barista's time so that they can give eye contact and look the customer squarely in the face. And, you know, I, I get amazed and I tour a ton of stores. I'm still touring stores even through COVID. I'm just doing my own driving um, to stores by myself in the, in the vehicle, in my own car, and just going to stores and walking in and spending time at a distance uh, with the baristas because they want to see us. And then I hear the conversations between the customers and the baristas and the excitement of them reconnecting. It's amazing to me. And it, and it helps me understand that um, some of this will be temporary, but what they really want is that human connection. And we can still provide that even if we're going to some of our convenience model, models. So we're pretty excited about that. And our customers are giving us great feedback right now. Yeah, as a person who's going through her second Zoom quarter, I, I totally empathize with that. Yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been really wonderful to see, so. And Roz, you are a bit different from a lot of our guests uh, for View from the Top in that many of them are CEOs, but you are a true operator and you've led massive organizations like, like Sam's Club and, and uh, Starbucks. Um, and I think you have this amazing ability to, to see the big picture, but also to really get into the weeds. Um, an example was that when you joined Starbucks, um, the, it was actually kind of a low point for the business and sales wasn't doing well. And you came in and quickly discovered some operational issues that really moved the needle. Um, one of them was an insight that store traffic was too slow at around two o'clock in the afternoon. That's and right. I, and I bet there could have been maybe 50 hundreds of issues that you could have looked into. Um, so how are you able to hone in so quickly at such a micro level? Sure. So, you know, one of the things um, being at Walmart is that, you know, you spent, you, we, we got a chance to spend a lot of time in stores. And after a while, I can almost walk in a store and get a feel for the operations of the store. One prime example is if I walk in a store, um, I can tell if the employees are not proud of their unit, they'll immediately look down at their feet. So I know they're either not proud of the operation, they recognize who I am, and I'm about to hear the story. So what I try to do when I walk in these units is to kind of diffuse that, to say, look, I'm here to help. I'm not here to reprimand. So, you know, I've thrown trucks at Walmart, which means unload at midnight. You know, I've done that. 
And, you know, I, I would in, enjoy getting behind the bar. I don't make the best latte, but I try my best to do latte art as best I can. looks a little weird sometimes. But, you know, I try to meet them where they are because I feel so responsible that there's probably something that we did at the home office that's creating a bad outcome at the store. So that's, that's part of it. But I've also, um, you know, having a background in chemistry, I'm a little bit of an analytic. So you can kind of watch your operation and see what's flowing and not flowing. And, um, and then match it with numbers and data and analytics and pretty, come out, pretty much come out with your solution. So, um, you know, understanding that we were maxing out in the morning, but then tons of opportunity in the afternoon. Um, it was a chance for us to say, what is, what's the menu in the afternoon? What's a customer looking for in the afternoon? Who's in the store in the afternoon? What's competition doing in the afternoon? And then, you know, we were able to adjust um, and offer something different in the afternoon day part and began to grow the business that way. So we dug ourselves out of a pretty deep hole um, back at that time. And, you know, it's still um, pre-COVID, uh, we were having some of the most fantastic results. And as you saw in our prior earnings, we're returning uh, to recovery um, in, in short order. So, um, you know, it pays off to be um, an operator. I, I will tell you, I say it's like the ultimate bob and weave. I've got to go high and create strategy and multi-year, you know, straight the, create the vision. Um, create a roadmap, give people something to aspire to, uh, create hope. But then I've got to be able to kind of live in their shoes to know that when I make these changes and I suggest big major growth initiatives, I have to understand what is it going to take to get this team to follow me. And I'm, I'm really um, glad that I had some of the small jobs that I had, but I realized the reason why I've had some of these small jobs too is because uh, quite honestly, you know, there were times in my career where I was given the you know, the unfortunate work to do. And I always had to do some of the toughest, dirtiest jobs. Um, and I had to do those. So, but it gave me a chance to learn and I try and put it to work every day and look at it as a blessing um, that I got some of the smaller jobs, the unfortunate positions. Yeah, it's amazing to hear that, that you took that experience and didn't complain about it, but, but rather turned it into a lot of empathy than, than now for your um, employees. Um, yeah. And it, it's interesting to see how, you, you know, it's a combination of both um, the analytics and then also just feeling the store and seeing the people. But again, Starbucks has thousands of stores and 300,000 employees. Yes. So when it's at that scale, how do you make sure you're successful in driving execution? And then uh, perhaps equally importantly, at motivating those people so, so they're aligned around the same goal? Sure. So it is all about your talent, right? And so having um, the ability to identify great talent, um, and it's not just individual talent, it's also looking at what's the dynamics of your team? How do you get that team to move like an, or like an orchestra? And that's what I always say is that I feel like I'm the conductor of the orchestra and I wanted to have its best performance. So I can't just select one or two good talents. I've got to figure out how are these people going to work together? Um, you know, prime example is um, right now the um, executive vice president for U.S. operations that reports to me. She is a fantastic people leader. She can motivate like something I've never seen. And when you've got that large number of stores, you need someone like that. And she's not one that I'm going to press about strategy. I'm not going to press about her spending because I trust she'll do that very well. But more than anything, I know she'll motivate that barista that's on the front line. And that's so important. So it really begins with the talent that you select and how you put those pieces together. And then how do you build the trusting relationships? Because they've got to know that I have their back every day. I instill that in them. I stand up for them. I fight for them. And so then I think when I do create that visionary message, they trust that I'm going to get them over the finish line, right? And they know I'm not going to leave them on the sideline. They know I'm not going to blame them. They know I'm going to dig into the details with them. And so we began to work together because I, I, I do believe in still rolling my sleeves up. Um, it, it takes that. You cannot, in, in retail today, if you're not willing to roll your sleeves up, um, get ready for some pretty mundane numbers because it takes you really getting into the trenches to get these companies to grow. And um, that's what it takes right now. And speaking of motivating people, I think this is a great segue into the second piece of your leadership, uh, which is leading with the heart. 
And um, as an Asian woman, I, I could sometimes get a little tired of questions around diversity and equality. But at the same time, I, I do recognize the value of sharing my own experience in the hope that it sparks conversation. So in that spirit, I would love to revisit a moment that was particularly difficult for you early in the days. Um, and it was only a few months after you had took over the Starbucks uh, America's business, two black men, Rashawn Nelson and Dante Robinson, were wrongfully arrested in the Starbucks store in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Now, I think many of us knew the facts of what happened later, but could you take us back to that moment? You just heard about the incident, you got on a flight, you're on your way to Philadelphia. What was going through your mind? Sure. So, you know, when I got the news, um, and, and it was interesting the way I began to pick up the news, and um, the news was really hot on Black social media, and it hadn't quite hit anywhere else. So I'm hearing it, and I'm letting, you know, other people in the company know, and it's kind of catching up with us that we got a problem in Philadelphia. Once we realized just how bad it was, um, we did, uh, I did take off to Philadelphia and, and meet some of my um, partners there. Um, the first thing that really startled me was that I was began, beginning to get the feed on the two gentlemen and I could see what they looked like. So I knew right away. So first of all, um, it was two people arrested. It wasn't, we didn't know that they were African-American males. It quickly became African-American males. And then when I saw them, the first thing I thought about is, um, wow, you know, this, this is not going to be good. In addition to, they look so familiar to me, right? Because um, they're everything that I've seen in my communities, right? And by the way, I have a son. I had a, my son was that exact same age. And so I looked at what happened and thought, this could happen to my son any day of the week. And um, I was actually terrified because those two gentlemen went to jail that night and they stayed there overnight just for having walked into a Starbucks. And there's something wrong with that. There's something wrong. And I knew right away there was something wrong. And um, we got into Philadelphia, um, created a war room and began to work on this situation. And the first thing was to make sure that these two gentlemen returned safely to their home. And, uh, and we were engaged in, in, um, in, in that work um, and then began to tell the story and to admit that uh, Starbucks did something wrong here. And, you know, our policies failed us. Our leadership failed us. Um, this happened under, I felt like it happened under my watch. Um, I was running, I'm running U.S. operations, part of my responsibility. And these two gentlemen, um, the police were called after 10 minutes of being in our stores. Now, um, that's not what we do at Starbucks. And so I knew, um, and then I looked at the young woman who was running that store. And like I mentioned before, leadership um, is, you know, a, a, all about the talent that you select. And she's a fine talent. But for her to work at a store at 18th and Spruce in Philadelphia, and she's a young new leader, we set her up for um, failure. And then the whole system falls down, falls apart. And the interpretation of policies was taken for granted. Um, we had work to do. And the other thing is that we had not had the realization that what's happening outside a Starbucks store has begun to come inside the store. So homelessness and all those things that are happening in our communities. But our policies say, you know, allow people to have a beverage, sit down, stay for a while. If they're not ordering after about 45 minutes, you know, maybe encourage them to have a, a beverage. But you know, now people come into our stores for respite, right? And for warmth. And, but our policies were based on something years ago when that's not what a Starbucks store was you know, equipped to do. And our leaders weren't trained to how do you handle anyone coming in and outside the store? So it could be misinterpreted and it was. So we admitted our faults, um, but we got around this issue. We knew we needed to train on um, anti-bias training. There's some biases that were uh, likely involved in this. And we got after it and we continue to get after it uh, daily uh, with training and development and uh, leadership at the right time, right person in the right role. All of those things really matter in terms of how you want to manage. But it was frightening because I knew at any moment that could have been my son. And quite frankly, I got a call from my son 
and uh, he's living in New York. And he said, mom, you know, this thing is, this is bad and you have got to fix it. And I'm, and you've got to do this. You, this is all, this is everything you need to do right now. And when you hear your son talking to you, I picked up fear in his voice um, because I think he was saying, mom, fight for me because that's me. I felt that. And um, I fought like hell for him and for Dante and Rashawn that this will never happen again. And like you're saying, in that moment, yes, you're the COO, but you're also a mother and then you are part of the community. How did you think about balancing having your own voice versus uh, quote unquote being the voice of the company? Right, right. So, you know, I think, um, you know, timing is everything. I think the company was open to my influence on this situation. Um, I think they clearly recognize that I'm going to take care of the brand and do the right thing for the company. Um, but we all have to recognize when the company um, has not done its best work. And um, that was a very honest moment for all of us. And so I think there was immediate, um, you know, growing trust for me. They were getting to know me but um, they knew that I was going to take care of the company as well as take care of this situation because I felt like if I could influence Starbucks and, you know, the visibility of this brand, could we absolutely influence other companies? So all the training that we developed, we did it open source. So if any company called us and said, how did you do that? You know, you closed your stores. Where, what, who did your training? We developed our training. Here, take it. And it was expensive. And we gave it to any company or anyone who called us and said, look, we'll teach you how to do this. Um, no charge, because this is a problem not only for Starbucks, it's a problem in our society right now of making judgment of people, um, you know, prematurely. And um, it, it has to stop. And, you know, eight police officers called for two gentlemen sitting in a store is unacceptable. And we were fortunate that that's all that happened to those two gentlemen, that they had to stay overnight. Very fortunate, because we've since then, right, learned some other things that could be terrible. Yeah. Yeah, and it's good to know that in that moment, it seems like those two things really aligned. And yeah. yet it, it was still a very, a very emotional moment for you, right? You talking about fear and worry, and, and it just sounded really overwhelming. So how, how do you take care of yourself? in moments like that? Yeah, well, I'll be honest with you. For that period of time where we were in Philadelphia, the media was pretty hot. Um, I took on a lot of the local media. Um, the other good thing is that um, throughout my career, I've gotten to know pretty much most of the mayors across the United States. I make it my business to know them because I feel like I'm going to need to have a conversation with them, either in buying real estate in their city or investing or something. So um, I used my Rolodex like I never, <laughs> like I've never have. And I called in, you know, a, a lot of help for people to teach me how to have these uh, conversations. So I tried to keep my fear down and turn it into energy, it was sleepless. I mean, we didn't go to bed several days. I remember one day we had to go over to the courthouse and I'd run out of clothes. And so I had on um, a pajama shirt with my suit jacket over it. And so I kept pulling my jacket to cover up the little teddy bear on my shirt because I still had on my PJs up under there because I couldn't get out of the hotel because people were wanted to touch and feel us, I'll put it that way. And so you, it's amazing what you'll do when, you know, you've got a little bit of fear and anxiety, but you know, you've got, you've got work to do. You just uh, buckle down and do what you have to do. And wearing a pajama shirt up under your, you know, your suit is not the worst thing that'll ever happen to you. So you just have to keep your head on straight. It was hard to focus, um, but I knew that we were doing the right thing. And I knew that we were living in a historical moment and we had a chance to either do this very right or do it very wrong. But everything I had learned in my life came to bear in that situation. My son's face, these two young men who were trying to start a new business, they were there to have a conversation about starting a new company. Um, my new company that I was falling in love with, I didn't want them to fall on the ground. You know, the lovely young woman who we had hired to work in this store, what's going to happen to her? So everything was coming together. And so this whole concept of head and heart you know, that is the leadership model that makes you most successful in these heated moments because you can't have, if I went through this thing just with my head, I would have made a whole lot of different decisions. You know, it probably would have been much more abrasive. Um, and, um, but I was able to keep my head on straight. 
Thank you so much for sharing that really personal and, and emotional side with us. And it's inspiring to see that that actually helps you become more effective as a leader and, and not um, to your detriment. Um, Roz, as a senior leader, you're never afraid to say what, what is right. Um, but for some of us, and for me at least, um, as we're a bit earlier in our career, it could sometimes feel very risky uh, or and daunting to speak up if we don't feel like we have sufficient credibility or seniority. So I'm curious, how has your voice evolved as you became more senior? Sure. So what you just described, that was me early on in my career. Um, you know, I, I actually felt like my voice didn't really matter because I was overlooked so much. I was like, well, they don't care to hear what I have to say, so I can go to a meeting unprepared or, you know, because they're not ever going to call on me. It doesn't matter, you know. And, um, you know, that's pretty frustrating after a while. I mean, you know, I was doing a job on my own self with that mentality. But then, um, and, and then my next, you know, the next part of me after that was trying to find my place and use my voice. And I then began to be too much like the company person. I began to dress like all the men at work and all of that crazy stuff. And it was ugly apparel. I hated it, but I did it anyway. And I was sick when I was driving home, like, who is this? And then I just, you know, and I'd get home and my family would be like, okay, why are you talking like that? And so then after a while, it was so stressful that I just said, I just have to figure out how to bring my whole self to work. So, um, you know, I have two children. I have a, a son and a daughter. My daughter is 17. Well, early on, you know, my daughter wanted to swim. She's African-American. So like every other black family, you have to get your daughter's hair braided. That's just the whole deal. If they're going to swim, you got to get their hair braided. So one day I'm leaving work. They're like, why are you leaving early? I was like, I got to go get my daughter's hair braided. Swim class is starting. They're like, why are you braiding her hair? I was like, because if I don't, <laughs> I, I'm going to have to deal with this hair on her head. And so I had to explain cornrows to people I work with. And after a while, I just decided it was so stressful trying to hide. I could have said, oh, I'm leaving the office for a doctor's meeting, a doctor's appointment. I was like, no. I got to go get cornrows done. So I was, you know, let me tell you what that's like. I got to sit here for eight hours, you know, in, in the salon. So, um, but once I started doing that, I felt so much better. The stress was so high of me trying to be two different people. I could not bear it anymore. I was not myself. And so I just reconciled that I've got to bring my whole self to work. And the more that I was like who I am in my day, in my personal life at work, actually work took off because I think people got to know me better and they knew how they could see me for me and there was no shell they had to peel off. So it was uncomfortable for my peers, my boss, everyone else. But once I started, once I decided, what do I have to lose? You know, um, so it was so much better. But the other thing I, I look back on, and this is what I tell when I have a, a new hire that's uh, straight from school is that we know why we intentionally hired you. You know, this isn't a numbers game. But if I hire an Asian woman, that's because I want an Asian woman's voice at the table. So if you come and don't use your voice, I feel like I got a bad investment here. So I always tell folks, understand why you're here. Don't be bashful about it. Let's be clear. I need an Asian woman's voice at the table. So that's why you're here. This isn't anything about, you know, um, I need, you know, to hit a number, a diversity number. And so sometimes when I see people sitting back in their seat and not engaging in the conversation, I will call on them and say, what do you think? And they hate it. Um, but after a while, and then I don't, you know, I just say, okay, good idea, move on. You know, but I keep picking on them until they feel, because first of all, you got to hear yourself talk. And once you hear yourself talk, you're like, okay, I can talk. I mean, you know, it's just that simple. And then when people nod, people will nod at your idea. Then you're going to find somebody that's going to use your idea once you say it. They're just going to say it a little different. And then after a while, it just it becomes a, pro a process. But don't sit silent in the room. And I try my best. Whenever I see that, I always call that person out and um, try to give them a platform. And I'll endorse what they say. I'll help them with their viewpoint. I see that they're struggling because it absolutely, it still takes that. But don't be silent in the room. Even if you think you're going to make a mistake, that's better than sitting there quiet because you began to suffocate, to be honest with you. You'll suffocate your opinion yourself. It'll change your self-esteem. So just get it out there and feel like you have value. 
And I think it's so important. That is amazing advice. And Roz, you've been advocating for equality for many years, but it a lot of times it just seems like things haven't changed as much as we would have loved them to. And I know this year has been particularly difficult for a lot of us as we continue to witness racism and injustice. And at times it could feel very overwhelming and disheartening. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious if you see any hope in the moment and, and what do you think we can all collectively do to use this moment to move forward together? Yeah, you know, um, I'll be uh, really frank with you. You know, there's been some days where I've had to really pull myself up um, to say and do the right thing, you know, because I'm human too. You know, I'm a mom, you know, the Ahmaud Aubrey thing really struck me hard. Um, that one stuck with me. George Floyd murder stuck with me. Um, you know, I have, it's so interesting, I have all nephews and only one niece. And so all these black males, young black males are around me. And so I remain nervous and scared for them right now. And, you know, wondering what more that I can do. But I pull myself up knowing that if I stay steadfast to set the example, engage as many people as I can in conversations and use myself as an example to teach and educate, Maybe I do have a way to begin to change these narratives and the views of people. Um, the other thing I think that um, that I've been really focusing on is getting people to vote um, and vote in the vote in every election. I don't care if it looks like a school superintendent and you're you know just go vote you know. Um, and so I'm I've been a pretty big advocate for that. Um, it's the best way we can change and have our voice heard um, is to vote. I think also too, I'm, I'm an optimist. And I think that there is something about a pandemic happening during the time of social unrest, during the time of some of the most environmental, ish, biggest environmental issues ever between. In one week we had fires, flooding and storms all in one week across two different parts of the country. Um, and then the outcome of this is to see the inequities of who gets help and who doesn't get help. And so, you know, when you see about, you know, you, you see things like what's happening with COVID and you can't say, well, why is that happening? Well, why are African Americans and Latinos, why are they more exposed? Well, it's because of housing and living conditions. Years ago, asthma is something that is environmental, right? And so what was their housing situation like? Where are there opportunities for medicine? And by the way, where's the education system? So what this is doing right now, this very moment that we're in, it's, it is unveiling the weaknesses in our country like never before. So while we all regret it, I personally regret it, it is now pulling the covers off of so many embedded issues that we have to face because these things will happen again. But hopefully we'll never go into a pandemic while our communities are in such social unrest, so um, you know, put in positions where healthcare is not available to them, hopefully we'll begin to do things different because right now we have a laser beam on the real ills of our country right now, and we should be paying attention to those. Yeah, that's very true, and I hope more people would not just pay attention but also be part of it and and share the burden. Exactly. Yeah, and I, I can't wait. I hope soon enough we'll be so obsessed about talking about equality the same way that we're obsessed with uh, quarterly earnings today. Exactly, exactly. That's so true. You're right about that. Roz, I, time just flew. Um, I'm at the, we're at the end of the interview. It's truly been a pleasure. Um, we did select some students for a Q&A session, um, so we'll turn to those student questions right now. Awesome. That's great. I think we see the first student on the screen. Do you mind introducing yourself before the question? Of course. Hi, Roz. Hi, Joy. Um, I'm Marsha Austin. I'm an MBA one here at the GSB. Great. And so my question for you is this. Um, what was the most pivotal point in your career that you think was the point that led you to the C-suite? Hmm. Uh, I think... Probably the most pivotal moment um, that led me to the C-suite was 
When I left Kimberly Clark after uh, 22 years of being in the CPG industry, I was group president of uh, global manufacturing and operations, and I left there to take a role at Walmart as a vice president, a regional uh, leader out in the field running stores. And I knew either I was crazy or I was determined to do something great. Um, at the time, Walmart didn't have the best reputation at that time. And um, I knew I was walking into either a gold mine or you know, something else. But it was an opportunity for me to really step up. I really wanted to impact the most people that I possibly could. And Walmart has 2.2 million employees. And I said, you know what, Roz, forget about, you know, I really wasn't thinking about the C-suite. I was thinking about impact. But now I realize, um, you know, impact comes with scale and growth. And I knew um, as soon as I got in there, I was promoted four, four months after I uh, came in as a VP. I was made senior vice president. And then within a year, executive vice president. So, um, you know, but again, I wasn't in pursuit of the CEO job. I actually, you know, when I got the call for the Sam's role after being with the company for five to six years, um, you know, I knew then I was like, oh, wow, this must be a big opportunity, <laughs> you know? So it wasn't like I was looking for that, but I think that moment where I said, I'm willing to throw away a title, a comfortable job to go to an environment, um, I knew I had something in me that I was trying to satisfy and it was impact. And so I think that that gets you to some of the higher levels when you pull yourself out of trying to get a title and put yourself into a big problem to solve. Thanks yeah, that really resonated. And I think here in the Silicon Valley, we probably sometimes bias towards like founding our own thing and creating impact that way. But yeah, two million employees. Um, that's that's like that's impact for you. That's impact. That's right. Uh, we'll go so to the hi, second Rose. question. Yeah. So hi, hi, good morning from Germany. <laughs> Yeah, so my name is Violeta. I'm, I'm in Stanford LEAD program. It's my first month and I'm very, very happy and excited that I have the opportunity to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. On one side, you have mentioned about uh, COVID speeding up your pipeline, your innovation lab projects. Mm -hmm. But I'm interested about now, about the current situation. So, so my question is, how do you manage to operate successfully under this COVID-19 situation? to maintain a durable and growing business? Yes, um, I love this question because, you know, we're trying to understand what is gonna, you know, remain permanent. What, you know, um, I don't really enjoy the term new normal, but there's gonna be some permanence out of this. And then there's some things that's very temporary and trying to separate the two of those um, is where the difficulty uh, comes into play. Um, but I will tell you, um, you know, one of the things we're learning about COVID is, you know, how important it is to keep your business sharp. You know, we've got a pretty clean balance sheet. So we went into this um, in a strong financial position, but not knowing whatever, you know, what could happen to your business. Um, you know, it just reminds us all to run this thing pretty sharp because, you know, there's some companies that are not going to make it and that are relying on a lot of help from, um, from the government. Um, so it's, it's just a reminder, you know, going through this COVID experience in terms of how important it is to stay sharp. Um, I also will say that um, who would have ever thought that we would have a life living in um, technology like we're doing right now? And how can we, you know, remain humanized, you know, like the question that I got earlier, um, you know, about, you know, what are those things? How, you know, do we keep the Starbucks brand fresh? But I'll tell you is that if you've not learned empathy through this instance, um, you shouldn't be a leader right now. Because people, this is very difficult. We have young mothers who are on Zoom calls all day while they're trying to teach a four or five year old how to get themselves through a Zoom call and get their lessons done. Um, I, 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 I'm telling you, I feel so blessed that my kids are older because I'd have to throw in the towel. And we cannot afford to have women not in the workplace. That is just not acceptable. It can't happen. We've got to think of other solutions. One of the things I've done in my um, organization is that we have no meetings before 9 a.m. 
um, because you need to get the kids settled and get them at least in front of the laptop and pack a lunch and prop them up in front of that screen. That's the reality. And then we have something on Fridays called Quick Connect Fridays. And the only thing you're allowed to do on a Friday is call someone and say hello. Um, you can't have any business, any serious business meetings. Um, and it's for you to reflect on the week, recognize people, give people recognition, and call and check on somebody. And so we call it Quick Connect Fridays and no meetings Monday through Friday before 9 a.m. And that's one of the things that COVID has taught us is to meet your employee base where they are. And um, it's important now and it's going to be important for a while. He's just waiting for the third student to come on the screen. Hi, Roz. Uh, my name is Steve Soma. I'm also a member of the Stanford LEAD program. And my question, and I think you kind of touched on this a little bit, but maybe you could expand on it, was how has the shift to remote work uh, influenced your leadership style, if at all? Yeah, so um, what I just mentioned is, is part of it. But I think the other part is I'm finding as a leader that I have to be very intentional. Um, because, you know, when you've got someone engaged in a camera, you know, it's not like you're going to lean over and have a casual discussion and, you know, create the sidebars. And sidebar conversations can be very rich, right? Because you kind of vibe off of each other. So one of the things that I worry about a bit is that what about our future innovation? Because innovation happens when, you know, brains collide and conversations happen. So we've been you know, using some unique software for that um, to help us as software called Nero that you probably are familiar with. Or um, you know, just, um, you know, I was able to uh, go over to the home office this week in Seattle and spend some time in our innovation lab just to connect with people to say, I see the work you're doing. I you know, love what you're doing and to keep on. So I'm spending a lot of my time um, just making sure that I have these connection points with individuals and making sure that innovation keeps going. That's one of the things I worry about is that, um, you know, refilling that pipeline of, of innovation right now. Rose, I love that. Even though you were talking about innovation, but you are still fundamentally talking about people and meeting them where they are and, and um, making sure that they could have a voice. Um, I have one last question for you before we wrap it up. Um, we'll be asking this question to all the speakers that join us this year. Right. What principles do you rely on when you're facing the toughest moments as a leader? Hmm. So in my toughest moments, um, first of all, I rely on high integrity. And so first and foremost, I want to make sure that I am doing the right thing um, by the situation and my integrity nor the integrity of the company is going to be impaired. So I would have to say high integrity is the first thing. The second thing that I rely on is um, trust. I want to make sure that each and every day I'm building um, trust. People want to know that they work for somebody that cares about them and wants to, um, and that they can be depended upon. So I, I rely on, on trust and trusting relationships. And then lastly, I think what I depend on, and this is the operator in me, is just doing what I say I'm going to do. And that's not always easy. You know, I have competing objectives sometimes. I have a very tough calendar. Um, I'm a director of one of the largest companies in the world that, you know, is a fantastic company, Amazon. Um, so I have to make sure that I can deliver on what I say I can do because it's part of who I want to be known for. Um, I want people to um, feel like they can trust me and that they can count on me. So that, that really matters to me quite a bit. Thank you for sharing that. Roz, I, we learned so much from this conversation about managing massive organizations, about motivating people, making tough decisions, but, but I think above all about how we should and can show up as ourselves and, and with our values and speak up when, when uh, something's not right. Yes. So yeah, I thank you again for joining us and uh, thank you for making our world a more equitable and well caffeinated place. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much. I've so enjoyed this. And, you know, to the students and the faculty there, um, keep doing great things. I mean, the most important thing we can do is just get into the minds of 
you know, young people, make them feel valued, um, show them the ropes and the roadmaps and the future and the vision of what can be. And um, we'll all get through this. Um, we'll all be better for it. So, but thank you for having me. Thank you, Roz. It's been an honor.